just a couple of housekeeping things. If you have questions uh, for the panelists, uh, we will save them until the end. Um, and uh, you can type them into the chat function uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, <clears throat> and I will read the questions uh, uh, after the presentations. Um, we also have with us uh, Alexandra Kichi, who is the president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, who will uh, speak with us to us after the presentations. Uh, but first, I would like to uh, ask Rustem Irse, who is the president of the Canadian Association of Crimean Tatars, to uh, address us before we start our discussions today. So, uh, Rustem, please. We can't hear you, Rustem. Sorry. Your your internet is cutting out. Rustem, are you there or no? I mean, we can. Uh, you can speak. Maybe we'll do the panelists first, Rustem, and then you can speak after because we're. I think your connection is is bad. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Olya Skripnik, the chair of the board of the Crimean Human Rights Group, uh, to speak to us and give us the overview of human rights developments in Crimea in the last years. So please, uh, Pani Olya. Thank you, Rest. Uh, good morning uh, and good afternoon to all participants. I'm Olga Skripnik, head of the Crimean Human Rights Group. We uh, work in field in, in Crimea and collect evidence of human rights violations and war crimes. Me and my colleagues uh, from Crimea, uh, but now uh, our public office is based in Kyiv and we work uh, in Crimea underground because uh, today uh, Work of Ukrainian, uh, working of Ukrainian human rights defenders uh, in Crimea is very dangerous. But we have opportunity to collect evidence, transfer them to international uh, court institutions, and we try to help and protect Crimeans uh, in occupation situation. So uh, I would like to start and um, say about some trends that confirm the systematic violations and impunity of Russia for, for many crimes. Uh, first of all, it's of course issue of political prisoners. Uh, unfortunately, the number of political prisoners is constantly growing. Uh, for example, despite the last uh, release of uh, 11 political prisoners in 2019, including collections of Volodymyr Balog, no new releases happened after that. And at the same time, uh, for example, last uh, year, at least 24 persons were deprived of liberty and uh, six more Crimean Muslims were arrested in February this year uh, on political reasons. And now more than 110 Ukrainian political prisoners are in custody. And uh, for example, new, like, new trend uh, last year that the occupation authority has not only began criminal proceedings, but also for the first time imprisoned Jehovah's Witnesses members for their religion beliefs. Crimean court sentenced two Crimeans, Sergei Filatov and Artem Gerasimov, to six years in general security prisons, and now um, uh, four Crimeans are under arrest in uh, Simferopol detention center. And Russia Federation, Russian Federation continues to systematically use the, its so-called anti-terrorist legislation in Crimea as a tool of political pressure and persecution. For example, last year, nine Crimean Tatars were arrested on a suspicion of belonging uh, to Hizbut Tahrir and of spreading terrorist uh, ideology. And we call it case against Crimean Muslims. And according to the human rights defenders, the total number, number of Muslims under this case, uh, 70, uh, 75 persons. Among those accused in terrorism, there is a number of civil, uh, civic uh, activists and citizen journalists including members of Crimean Solidarity Civic Initiative. And for example, in September, a Russian military court sentenced uh, the seven Crimean uh, Tatars of the case against Crimean Muslim, convicting them to long prison sentence from 
13 to 19 and among uh, years in, uh, in, in uh, colony. Among them uh, are activists and citizen journalists from Crimean Solidarity Initiative, as well as Crimean Solidarity's coordinator, human rights defender Shrevey Minister Five. Last year, uh, 15 prison sentences were passed in political motivated cases. And very important is the situation with coronavirus in uh, detention centers in, and uh, in prisons, ignoring the international recommendation on preventing uh, the outbreak of uh, coronavirus in um, detention places. The practice, the Russian practice of keeping in custody is a pretrial restriction measure has been preserved that kept the Simferopol detention center overcrowded. And last year, Crimean and Russian courts, as a part of political motivated persecution of Crimean residents, <laughs> ordered uh, 260 decisions for the detention or uh, prolongation of detention for the duration, uh, duration uh, of the pretrial investigation. Next issue, it's um, about persecution uh, of freedom of, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, and uh, now still still um, position like Crimea is Ukraine remains a crime in Crimea and Russia is a prison for such expression. Uh, just uh, two examples. In September last year, a resident of Ifatoria and uh, young uh, man from Odessa who arrived in Crimea were detained by the FSB uh, under criminal article, uh, so-called public appeals to actions aimed to violating the territorial integrity of Russian Federation for flyers calling for the return of Crimea under control of Ukrainian government. The young men are facing a sentence uh, for up to four years in custody. And one more example, since 2019, uh, Ukrainian citizen Galina Dovhopolova, 66 years uh, old, resident of uh, Sevastopol, is in detention center. Uh, she is Ukrainian activist who publicly supported Ukraine and called Crimea Ukraine. The woman is uh, charged with article high treason that is uh, punishable with imprisoned, uh, imprisonment for 12, uh, for 12 to 20 years without any alternatives. Uh, moreover, we constantly record uh, the use of violence and degrading treatment during detention, the use of violence against detainees, detention in conditions, uh, threatening life and health, refusal to provide the necessary medical care in Crimea. And one more issue con um, connects with torture, because the Russian occupation authorities kept on denying to investigate statements of torture, and those responsible for torture <coughs> go unpunished. Uh, one example about FSB, as to the FSB, no criminal case at all was found in the Crimean so-called courts. Uh, thus, most applicants uh, stating the effect of torture during the political reason persecution indicate the FSB to be guilty. Uh, next issue connect with uh, informational isolation in, um, of Crimea. Uh, the Ukrainian FM radio stations in Crimea were constantly blocked by the Russian broadcasters and websites of top Ukrainian media and website of Mejlis of Crimean Tatar people who were blocked in Crimea. And Russian authorities also increased scramble the signals uh, of Ukrainian radio stations by new TV and radio tower for transmitting Russian radio programming on the same frequency, frequ uh, frequencies last year. Uh, and uh, new restrictions uh, was last year, for example, new law, new Russian law on the Federal Security Service prohibits the dissemination uh, of information that damages the uh, reputation of the FSB without the consent of, its, of the FSB. This law makes it impossible to public criticize the illegal actions of FSB and uh, disseminate information about the human rights violations. And maybe my last point, but not least, trend of human rights violations, it's militarization of civilian population. Uh, Russian Federation continues to illegal conscription of Ukrainians living in Crimea into the Russian army. Uh, Russia held uh, 12 draft campaigns uh, with at least 20,000 men from Crimea drafted uh, into the armed forces of Russia and the draft is were sent to military bases of the, in the Russian Federation. And part of uh, huge militarization is of course militarization of children. 
it's more threatening. The Russian Federation provides, provides combat training of children, students, and general aims of Russian educational system in Crimea are shaping Russian national identity among students, among children. And the fundamental document of education institutions of Crimea, in fact, is the order of the Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation number 210. This is a special department program of the Russian Ministry of Defense on patriotic education system. So the education of children in Crimea became part of large scale militarization of civilian population. And now more 200,000 Crimean children are constantly influenced by the militarization educational system. And of course, uh, finally, um, we see that this situation show uh, us that a new mechanism uh, needed to protect human rights in Crimea. And of course, the occupation of Crimea, it's not only uh, like political question, it's uh, integral part of the uh, restoration of the rights and protection uh, of Crimeans. So that's why we support um, initiative of Ukrainian government, Crimean platform, because we need to find new mechanism to protect human rights uh, in Crimea. And I can, uh, uh, I will stop and pass for my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Olyo. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ali Maliev, the Deputy Direc Director General of the Ukrainian Institute, uh, to speak to us about the situation with the uh, indigenous Crimean Tatar population in, in Krim. Uh, please, Alim. Hello, everyone. Доброго дня, доброго ранку. It's a pleasure to attend for this important event. Uh, my name is Alim Aliyev, and I'm working in the Ukraine Institute. Uh, Ukraine Institute is a, uh, is a public institution affiliated with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Ukraine. And our mission is uh, to strengthen Ukraine international standing through the means of cultural diplomacy. Before this, uh, I'm working uh, in a Crimean House and founded uh, Crimea SOS NGO. And I want uh, to give some points about uh, the situation with the Crimean Tatar people, as an in indigenous uh, people, uh, Crimea population of Crimea, and what we are doing in uh, Ukraine now. Uh, you know that uh, the Crimean Tatars have always supported the territorial integrity of Ukraine as opposed to the pro-Russian separatist movement in Crimea before 2014. But despite uh, this, in my 2014, Russia occupied Crimea. And the rejection of inclusion of Crimea into Russia by the majority of Crimean Tatars led to a sharp conflict of the community and its leaders with in Ukrainian and Moscow authorities. Uh, since the beginning of March 2014, the Crimean Tatars are subjected to constant repressions and discrimination on, on the part of so-called new government. Uh, as Olga mentioned, uh, human rights organization in general documented more than 2,000 uh, cases of the human rights violations on the peninsula for the last seven years. Uh, among them, more than 100 cases of people placed under detention. And as you know, on February 17, a few days ago, uh, the FSB conducted another series of searches and arrests of six uh, Crimean uh, activists and Crimean Muslims who spoke out against the political uh, persecution of, uh, of Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians. Also, near 200 children have been left without father care. Most of uh, these people are Crimean Tatars. But these violations uh, stem for the new reality sharpened by, by a few tendencies. Um, one more, Olga said about militarization. Yes, and militarization of consciousness is uh, one of the huge part of uh, propaganda mechanism uh, in uh, Russia. For example, 
a major goal of the UNARMIA movement in schools begin, being to popularize uh, military ideology, uh, foster a special bond uh, between young Crimean citizens and the Russian army and promoting the cult of violence and war. Uh, this Aeos army is a militaristic ring of the Russian movement of school students created by President Degrees on a uh, decree on October 2015. Second point, uh, making of the new Russia identity. The policies of the Russian authorities in Crimea include destroying the hist historical and cultural connection between the peninsula and the mainland Ukraine and inclusion on Crimea to the Russian ideological paradigm for, by forcing participation in political activities, control of visits uh, to polling station, and so on, so on. But also uh, Russian manipulation of Crimean history and propaganda in school. The concept of so-called Crimean people is actively being used in public discourse by Russian authorities. It's an attempt to amalgamate all inhabitants of, of the peninsula, regardless of their origin, the self in the, uh, identification, uh, identification of the Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians. This practice was also applied by the Soviet Union, so-called Soviet people, to erode the national identities uh, of the peoples. And Russia authorities purposely destroyed the Crimean Tatar and Ukraine uh, tangible and intangible heritage that do not fit into Russian ideology. You know the, the case of Hans Palace in Bakhtsarai. Yeah, it's uh, one of the most important object of Crimean Tatar tangible cultural heritage. And the Russian authorities have uh, recently embraced on so-called renovation works and the authentic materials and being replaced with the modern ants completely. And we say about uh, Ukraine and Crimean Tatar language. It's also the situation so bad. As for the right of, uh, to language, to education in the native, native language, uh, it must be said that uh, currently only 3% uh, um, of all studen uh, students uh, study in the Crimean Tatar language. And the share of students studying in Ukraine has been reduced uh, 50 times in seven years. And today, there are only uh, near 300 students who continue their education in Ukrainian language. One more uh, uh, point is the population replacement. Since the beginning of occupation, more uh, near uh, uh, 50,000 of the uh, inhabitants left Crimea. There, there are social active persons uh, disloyal uh, to the Russian authorities, Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians, uh, young professionals, students, business persons, public leaders, journalists, and cultural figures. But uh, the in Crimea, there is a reserve trend. The peninsula is colonized uh, from mainland of Russia by state officials, security officers, uh, uh, pensioners, and business uh, people. According to the medalists uh, of Crimean Tatar people, the number of people who arrived in Crimea reached uh, 500,000 people. And you know, over the time, there are several attempts of changing the ethnic composition in Crimea by squeezing the indigenous people uh, in the uh, peninsula. From uh, 18th century, 
when uh, Catherine uh, said uh, second, or Catherine, not for me great, uh, uh, first time annexed uh, Crimea, also after the Stalin's deportation in 1944. And last point is the point about uh, building parallel institutions. You know that uh, leaders of Crimean Tatar people, Mustafa Jamilev, Rifat Chivar, Fakhtenchi, Gosel Mimerv, and other uh, active uh, members of Majlis uh, now in Kyiv. Some of them uh, are uh, persona non grata in Crimea. But Russia built parallel uh, pro Kremlin, pro Russian uh, institution. In, uh, among Crimean Tatars. For today, it, it's not popular. And I hope that it's never be popular in uh, Crimea and, and especially among Crimean Tatar people. And uh, my second uh, point is what we are doing now here in uh, Kyiv, uh, Olga said about uh, Crimean platform and its uh, Fox, uh, huge element of the occupation of Crimea. Yeah, we have this systematic platform when we, when experts, uh, ministers, and presidents talked about Crimea and made a roadmap of Crimea. Uh, to, uh, the Ministry of Reintegration of occupied territories uh, make a strategy of development and popularization of the Crimean Tatar language. And it's also an important step. Uh, we are in uh, um, Ukraine Institute to uh, creating now a Crimean focus. It's a, it will be a multidisciplinary program of the Ukraine Institute aimed at raising the issue of the temporary occupied Crimea straightening the voice of who uh, defends the Ukraine peninsula, both in Crimea and on the mainland of Ukraine, and per uh, particular, of course, the Crimean Tatars. And uh, la last my point, sorry for, <laughs> for, for uh, a lot of time, is that Crimea is not only beautiful landscapes and delicious cuisine is the memories, uh, tears, struggles, and dreams. This is a place of strength of the Crimean Tatars. I have now been to my na native Crimea for seven long, uh, seven long years. During this time, <laughs> a, full, a whole new generation went to school. During this time, uh, the world uh, engulfed by coronavirus pandemic. But seven years have passed since Russia decided to uh, redraw the, the world map and level existing international agreements. But these seven years, we have been making our way home through struggle indifference and uh, uh, vision of common future. And in Crimea, hundreds of thousands of our uh, compatriots of our people do not give us, uh, do not give up uh, our position and waiting for us. And this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And we will definitely overcome this marathon and we are definitely meet in our three box side. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, um, Alim. Uh, and our final speaker is um, Maria Tomak, who is the co-founder of the Media Initiative for Human Rights. Uh, Maria will talk to us about the response from the Ukrainian SCOs and uh, recommendation, policy recommendations for Western, Western governments. Uh, Maria, please. 
Uh, thank you, Orest. Thank you, colleagues. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, to Ukrainian Canadian Congress for initiating this event and also to um, Postcards for Prisoners project uh, for also supporting this event, but most of all for the supporting political prisoners throughout the recent years. Uh, I have prepared a few slides and I am going to share my screen now. Hopefully you will be able to see my presentation. Um, so um, I will briefly tell you, uh, I will briefly tell you about the um, situation with uh, NGOs respond uh, towards the occupation of Crimea. Uh, probably you aware you are aware that um, back in 2014 uh, there was a bunch of um, grassroots initiatives that appeared in Crimea um, and also in the mainland of Ukraine and they were primarily dealing with um, the assistance to the IDPs um, because people were leaving Crimea like massively probably um, and also uh, they were collecting some uh, information in the field and some evidence and so on uh, but now uh, seven years actually passed and um, the landscape of uh, the NGOs dealing with this issue um, has a bit changed so I will tell you how exactly so as of now uh, there are uh, human rights NGOs and think tanks that are following the situation in the field in Crimea. And uh, I mean those uh, who fled from Crimea to the mainland of Ukraine, like the organization of Olya Skripnik. It's a great example. Um, also those organizations, Ukrainian organizations that are staying and were staying and appeared in the mainland of Ukraine, like my organization. We are <clears throat> working a lot with the Crimean issue, but I have kind of, I have no direct connections with Crimea. Although uh, back in 2014, when the occupation just started, we, my colleagues and I, we went to Crimea several times and, we, and we've collected some evidence in the field. And I'm proud to say that our materials were enclosed to the uh, materials that were filed by the Ukrainian government uh, to the European Court for Human uh, Rights in the case against Russian Federation. And uh, Kremlin was extremely uh, nervous by by these um, testimonies uh, so um, and also we have uh, international NGOs um, Ukrainian branches of international NGOs that are working uh, with uh, the issue of Crimea and it's important to say that uh, all these organizations they cover of course um, the policies that are applied by Russian Federation in the occupied area of Kremlin, but they also follow the Ukrainian policies because when it comes to the Crimean issues, you always have this question whether Ukraine is doing proper amount of efforts in order to stay connected with Ukrainian citizens in the occupied areas and ensure the rights of these people and ensure that uh, we're doing uh, all the possible um, things in order to keep that connection, but also in order to um, deoccupy the uh, Crimean Peninsula. Uh, then uh, it is, uh, I mean, it's a miracle indeed that we still have people in Crimea, inside Crimea that are struggling. And first of all, um, I have to admit Crimean Solidarity Group, it's the initiative that was mentioned by my colleagues previously. Uh, and I will probably say a few words about them later because I think that their work is probably underestimated because it's a totally peaceful initiative that is um, supporting the human rights cause uh, and the humanitarian cause and they're absolutely fearless it's uh, amazing so and one of the um, kind of um, di directions of their work is the Crimean childhood initiative so they support children of political prisoners and as of moment at least 210 
children are left without parental care and 15 of them were born after the arrest of their fathers. And we're going to organize, by the way, in the nearest time, the photo exhibition, it will be uh, online. So I will share with uh, colleagues and you can also find this exhibition online with the children that were born actually after the arrest of their fathers. And also I have to mention Majlis of Crimean Tatar people. It's not an NGO, of course, it's a representative body of uh, Crimean Tatars, but it's important that this organization is bound uh, this uh, this organ, uh, this body is banned and criminalized in Russia, and therefore it's persecuted in the occupied Crimea as well. Uh, we still don't have uh, any criminal cases uh, precisely with the accusations in membership in Majlis, but it's kind of a threat which is all the time there. And uh, we understand that anytime the occupying authorities can use that um, um, possibility provided by the Russian legislation in order to uh, persecute people, many people, many more people in Crimea. Of course, it's important that we have media that highlighting specifically the Crimean issue. And of course, there's a lack of information about Crimea in the uh, national media. Uh, in popular TV channels, but uh, we have uh, some media that are focused on Crimea precisely, like one of the projects Krim uh, Reali uh, launched by Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Also, we have some special Crimean media um, outlets that fled from Crimea, and now they're working in the mainland, so it's possible to get the information about Crimea, uh, uh, although it's, it's becoming uh, more and more complicated because journalists got um, banned from entering Crimea. And uh, so it's like, a, it's, a, it's a problem with the access to information, of course. And I would also like to emphasize one trend with, when it comes to civil society organizations. I think that we have this positive trend of more and more interaction between the state, Ukrainian state, I mean, and civil society organizations. And in some, in some cases, we have also integration of civil society organizations in the state institutions, which I consider a great uh, tendency. Uh, because of course, um, Ukrainian citizens have to take take the responsibility for the policies of their state. And we have uh, good examples of the mission of the president of Ukraine in Crimea. And we have like three uh, of our colleagues that are running this uh, institution that are kind of representatives of civil society organizations previously in their previous life. Also in the parliament and also my colleague Ali Maliev is actually a good example as well, since he's now uh, working for the uh, one of the state affiliated agencies. Yes, so, and previously he was a member of the civil society groups. Um, a few words more about civil solidarity group that are that is working from inside the Crimea. They were established in 2016 and currently they're dealing with the humanitarian assistance to the families of um, political prisoners. But most important thing is why they are so much disliked by the occupying authorities is that is because they are documenting the human rights violations in Crimea. And uh, so, for instance, they come when there's information about uh, searches um, conducted by the FSB, Federal Security Service of Russia in Crimea. Um, so they come there and they make this live streaming uh, and uh, that's how we, re we recognize, we know that something is going on in Crimea. And uh, we, unfortunately, we don't have anyone, uh, we, we don't have any this sort of in initiatives in Donbass. Uh, of course, the circumstances is quite different, uh, I would say, because in Crimea, at least, we, uh, Russia recognizes that it has control over Crimea. In Donbass, it's much more complicated, but still, I have to say that it's very important uh, that we have someone 
uh, documenting there what is going on in the field. Otherwise, it's much more complicated for us also to bring this information to the attention of the public. And because of that work, um, um, members of Crimean Solidarity uh, Initiative are persecuted. Uh, they are persecuted for the alleged terrorism um, accusations, and they got like many, many years of imprisonment, like 12 to 18 or 19 years of imprisonment uh, without conducting any violent acts and without even planning any violent acts. So just for kind of alleged participation in some terrorist group, which is obviously ridiculous. So, and here you have some links, uh, you can see some links to their um, uh, web resources that you can visit. Um, so as I said previously, uh, there are lots of people that are persecuted uh, as we consider it for their um, civil participation, for their activism, for documenting human, human rights violations and for uh, covering them in, uh, in public resources. Uh, like they, we call them civic journalists. They're not professionals, but uh, they are the ones who risk their life and highlight the situation in Crimea. For instance, Seran Saliyev, Server Mustafaev, and um, as my colleagues have already mentioned, there was some arrest. There were some arrests conducted in the previous week, and two of at least two of the arrested people are also members of um, uh, Crimean Solidarity: Azamat Yupov and um, Lenur and uh, Lenur C. Uh, I apologize, say the meta. Uh, and also, you know, when it comes to Crimea, we, of course, we all the time emphasize that people who are there, uh, who are co uh, courage enough uh, to stay there, um, they are victims of the occupation. But also, I would like to say that uh, people who stay there and who do some activism, they're really very, they're heroes. And especially when it comes to women, they inspire me so much. And uh, I just would like to say and to emphasize that we have very brave women in Crimea that, um, uh, that do some humanitarian work, that support children, that uh, do some human rights work. We have lawyer uh, Lila Hemedji, we have uh, Mumine Saliyeva, her husband is in prison for 16 years. She has two children, but still she's doing some activism. We have Lutfi Yezudieva, and she was persecuted for her activism, but they are still doing what they do. And I think it's important also to, um, to remember that there are still people who um, oppose these all these repressive practices in Crimea. Uh, and also I would like to mention the International Crimean Platform, which is uh, probably you've heard of this initiative. Uh, it's the idea of uh, proclaimed at the highest level of Ukra uh, Ukrainian government uh, and by the president and then supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, all of, uh, I, I mean, my colleagues and I were all engaged somehow in the preparations to this initiative. It, it should, uh, it, uh, should uh, kick start in August of the current year. And uh, again, I would like to say here that uh, um, civil society organizations are really very much engaged in this process. Uh, I think that to some extent, uh, the government just has to do that because for all these years, uh, Ukrainian civil society was really very active in uh, just collecting the information and helping the IDPs. And without NGOs, I don't think that government is able even to understand what has to be done in Crimea and about Crimea. So it's kind of, they have to engage um, a civil society. But uh, I mean, of course it's great. And one of the, uh, core elements of the Crimean uh, uh, platform um, as it's presented now is an expert network. It's not yet established, but it's in the process of establishing in the process of, con uh, I mean, the concept is, is uh, being discussed now. And uh, it has to work, the, the, the key thing here and about Crimean platform as for me is that it has to work not only throughout one day, 
but it has to work like all the time. And that's one of the challenges because uh, uh, of course it's complicated to support the operation of some sort of international initiative uh, uh, during like um, significant amount of uh, amount of time and um, I would like to say about some recommendations uh, again we have like dozens of different recommendations related to Crimea that are constantly uh, repeated throughout different international events and in Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe and some UN events and so on and so forth. But I was trying to like to um, to suggest some of the um, very actual as of now and given that the audience is not like uh, specialized uh, and but but for the general public so to say first of all of course it's important to share the information on the situation in Crimea you can find this information um, in the, on the uh, Facebook pages of various Ukrainian NGOs including Ola's uh, Crimean um, uh, human rights group, uh, including um, uh, Crimean Solidarity Group, that they, they also have this uh, uh, Facebook page in English, and also from some of the uh, pages of uh, Ukrainian state institutions, like the mission of the president in Crimea. Of course, it's important to support grassroots initiatives, and I think that or maybe the easiest way is to support for those who live in Canada is to support uh, Postcards for Prisoners uh, initiative. And just yesterday there was an event uh, uh, with the participation of uh, Oleksandsov, and he was again saying how it was important for him to get the letters from the overseas. Like it was very um, like, important for him, but also all these prisoner stuff, uh, they were very amazed and it, it provided special attitude for Oleg. Um, sanctions. Uh, I would say that it's a separate track and it's a very important uh, topic. And of course, we would like to ask you to request the Canadian government, but also the governments of the country that you represent now uh, to impose more sanctions related to the Russian occupation of Ukrainian um, territory and uh, precisely human rights abuses related to this occupation, in particular, according to the Magnitsky Act, which is um, adopted by the Canadian Parliament. And of course, there is a separate issue which is very complicated, is how to monitor the implementation of sanctions. I have to say that it's not easy. And uh, there are very loud, uh, there are very like loud cases uh, uh, when we see that uh, without some special attention to, um, uh, to, to events or to uh, businesses, uh, it's just impossible to track possible violations of the sanctions regime. And there is, there are kind of uh, pr pretty, uh, a big uh, number probably of cases when the sanctions are violated and only few of them are familiar to, to us. Uh, it's important to support the Crimean platform. I'm not ready yet to tell you how exactly it can be done, but uh, please follow the developments with the uh, Crimean platform um, in the uh, resources of uh, in the uh, web uh, pages of uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Facebook of our organization. So probably in the upcoming uh, months, we will publish uh, some ways to support it. Um, and also, uh, we would really like to ask you to help us to outreach to the expert community of the countries and academia in the countries that you live in and to organize events and to engage new researchers to research actually Crimea and what happened there and all the legal implications of the occupation of Crimea. So we would just like to make this um, problem more um, known among the experts and community and expert community and academia, because according to my observations, it's not a very popular topic uh, when it comes to Western academia. So, and I'm just, I think that it's possible to make it more popular, to make people more engaged in this issue and produce more papers unbiased um, to, to, 
uh, to make this problem more obvious and clear. And um, last but not least, uh, uh, I was not sure whether I should <laughs> uh, say anything about this kind of uh, recommendation, which is probably very political, but I think it's a high time to uh, emphasize this uh, issue um, while we're uh, observing all these developments with Navalny case. Um, I think that um, uh, we have to all the time to uh, ask international community to raise the issue of intentions towards Ukraine, Donbass, and about Crimea, of course, before all the Russian politicians and leaders, current or future, um, however democratic and liberal that might seem, but uh, as uh, the experience proves, it not, it's uh, not always, it means that this person is uh, liberal towards Ukraine. And unfortunately, I fully support the idea that Mr. Navalny has to be released and that he is imprisoned uh, illegally. But um, I also can't see in any of his public um, official programs any word about Crimea, that Crimea has to be deoccupied or anything that uh, should uh, make me feel that there will that he is he's is ready to stop this uh, uh, Russian um, expansionism. So I think that it's important very much, although it's not related so much to the topic of our today's discussion probably, but uh, that's a request from my organization. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Rustam Irse, uh, the president of the Canadian Association of Crimean Tatars, uh, who was supposed to speak before our event started, but unfortunately the uh, the internet gave out to uh, just uh, to say a few words, please, uh, Rustam. Hi, everybody. Do you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, sorry for inconvenience, Vitaly Uh First of all, I want to thank uh, UCC national and uh, co-hosting organizations for organizing this event and uh, you very much thank you very much for uh, two hour speakers for very informative presentations every year this year uh, these days uh, our organization it's Canadian Association of Crimean Tatars holding a rally at the Russian consulate together with Ukrainian organizations and with the participation of uh, Canadian representatives of the uh, from the both leading parties, the Liberal and the Conservatives. Uh, this year, despite the COVID, will be no exception, but we are preparing a small flash mob to show our solidarity with uh, all those who are now in uh, Russian prisons and all those who are, uh, continue to struggle in Crimea and continue to uh, resist the Russian occupation. Uh, unfortunately, the number of human rights violations in Crimea not only take place, but uh, continue to grow. Uh, not a month passes without searches of arrests, uh, isolation of the peninsula from the outside world not only makes it difficult to obtain uh, timely qualified legal assistance, but also makes uh, the life for every Crimean, and not only Crimean Tatars, all, all, every Crimean, it's uh, unbearable, and mostly for Crimean Tatars, indigenous population of Crimea, for sure. Uh, in context of the pandemic, again, uh, the indigenous people of Crimea were more affected. Uh, medical assistance is provided out of time. Hospitals are overcrowded and. Uh, there is no medicine, unfortunately. In this situation, uh, of course, only complete the occupation uh, will solve, if not all, many problems as with human rights, with the availability of uh, high quality standard of living. So are the problems with water as well, which are today uh, increasingly facing the occupation authorities. We uh, must remind our governments over and over again that only increased sanctions and organized global pressure can change the situation for the better. Let's don't give up and continue to work. Vitaly Shiraz, Nashuk Ukrainskih Speaker of 
Uh, thank you very much for your very informative uh, presentations today. И бажаю им всем успехов в их нелегкой работе. Дякую. Дякую, Рустам. And I'd like to ask uh, Alexandra Hichi, who is the national president of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, uh, to say a couple of words. Uh, Bless you, please. I would like to thank uh, our guests, uh, the Media Initiative for Human Rights and uh, Postcards for Prisoners for partnering with the Ukrainian Canadian Congress on this important event. And also to Rustem Irsai and the Canadian Association of Crimean Tatars for your support. And a big thank you to our presenters, Ola Skripnik, Alim Aliyev and Maria Tomak. Seven years after Russia invaded and occupied Crimea, it is vital that we do all that we can to keep the issue of the ongoing horrendous human rights abuses uh, front and center on the agenda of our government and our Canadian parliament. Uh, it's equally important that the political prisoners that Russia is jailing know that the world has not forgotten about them and that there is international pressure for their release. So thank you to Marta Bazouk and the team at Postcards for Prisoners for the wonderful work that you do. Uh, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress has long advocated for the government of Canada to take stronger action against Russia's human rights violations. The Magnitsky Act passed in 2017 gives our government the ability to do so. Uh, yesterday, with the assistance of our partners in Ukraine and the United States, we sent a briefing note to our government and to members of parliament identifying the Russian government officials and occupation officials responsible for these violations. We will work with our government to ensure that they are sanctioned. To our panelists, I was privileged to visit your beautiful homeland on three occasions between 1994 and 2014. I look forward to the day when you and all of us can return there safely and freely. Do zustrichiv pachchisarayu. We have a few minutes uh, left. I'd like to ask Marta Bozuk of the Postcards for Prisoners uh, project to uh, perhaps give us a, a short uh, overview of the project and how our uh, attendees and people on the line uh, can find out more and how they can help. So uh, Marta Budlask. Uh, thank you, Oris. And I, I, I want to thank you all for coming together for this important discussion, but especially Orest for, for being the engine that brought us together today. Uh, what I'm gonna to say now, I, I want to say a few words about postcards for prisoners, not to brag about what we, we've done in the past, but perhaps to inspire someone that there are simple things you can do that sometimes make a big difference. We started sending cards in 2017, organizing, Finding like finding audiences where we thought we would find like-minded people. So, for example, the Toronto International Film Festival will, was showing a, a film on a human rights issue in a related topic. So, asking them, could we have a booth there? And so, of course, the people who come to a film like that are actually interested in what we're doing and stop and signed cards. Same thing at the Canadian Museum Museum for Human Rights or a screening of a film about Boris Nemtsov. Um, so looking for opportunities to partner with other organizations. Uh, we, I'll show, we have uh, these cards. Uh, last time I went to the post office, they told me Russia is not, because of COVID, wasn't accepting international mail. So we slowed down a little bit during COVID, but are uh, ready to gear up again. And uh, I would just like to uh, piggyback on something Maria said. We do this and we've sent more than 5,000 cards to date. Mostly, maybe not mostly, um, maybe equally to raise the spirits of the prisoners, but also to put their jailers on notice that they're being watched, that people care about them. And also we use these opportunities, we leverage it to bring attention to the prisoners. Uh, for example, we worked with Penn Canada, the, uh, the human rights organization that defends freedom of speech and rights of authors. Uh, we organized an event at the, in the lobby of the Russian consulate 
and we invited the media and television cameras followed us as we went to the door of the Russian consulate to deliver postcards that were refused on camera. So it was a very powerful moment. I say all this because this is something really that could be done anywhere. If you'd like to find out more about us, the best way is on our Facebook page, Postcards for Prisoners, and message us and we'll respond. We have templates, we have labels with sentences in, uh, in, in uh, Ukrainian and Russian for people who don't um, know a Slavic language. We have labels of the addresses. Uh, so we try to make it very easy to send, be able to send the maximum amount of cards and have the maximum impact. Thanks so much for the opportunity to describe our work. Uh, Marta. We have about five minutes left. Um, I'm just going to get to a couple of the questions that we received uh, in the chat. Um, the first one, I think, is probably uh, best for Alim, but I think if anyone else wants to chime in as well. So the, the question is, uh, what programs exist in Ukraine to develop the Crimean Tatar language and culture and to inform Ukrainian public about the Crimean Tatar heritage? And uh, what are the major centers abroad to study Crimean Tatars and what would you see as help that can be rendered from the uh, academic community and academia? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I will start. Um, let me say about uh, Ukraine and the Ukraine state, we have a, a, really, a few programs, um, for example, uh, no, one week ago, uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian Cultural Foundation, uh, Crimean House, and Ukrainian Institute they made one uh, big, uh, uh, large, common uh, lot about Crimean Tatar culture. Uh, what it means? Uh, it means uh, to found it uh, permanent exhibition about Crimean Tatar culture history. Uh, and uh, traditions in Kyiv, because uh, for today we have any such museums in uh, mainland of Ukraine, and that's why it's uh, important uh, to establish such such museum and such exhibition. Uh, we have uh, uh, several uh, NGOs that work in, in uh, this topic. Uh, um, uh, like a uh, uh, Crimean house in Lviv, like uh, um, uh, Crimean uh, child, uh, 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 Crimean Krimska uh, Rodina from Ailes, Crimean family in uh, Kyiv, uh, and also a state enterprise Crimean house in Kyiv that um, promote uh, Ukraine and Crimean. Tata culture into Ukraine. And the second part of question was about, sorry. Um, uh, the second part of the question was what can uh, the abroad, academic abroad. community mm -hmm. do? Where, where to study uh, Crimean Tatar heritage abroad and what the academic community can do? Uh, I, I know that we have, in, uh, in, in a few uh, universities in the US uh, that studied Crimean Tatars, um, uh, it's a uh, um, heritage and also in Turkey, because in, uh, in Turkey, a huge Crimean Tatar diaspora land. And in our uh, focus on uh, Ukraine Institute, we want to develop the academic program that support uh, research uh, about uh, Crimean Tatar history and traditions and culture. Hope the such program will start all this year or, the, or in the next year. Thank you. Can I add something? Uh, yeah, please. Yes, yeah, sure. I want to announce that tomorrow uh, in Canada, we are starting a new program. Uh, so our cultural organization, uh, so uh, committee of uh, uh, Canadian committee, Canadian, uh, what is it? So our cultural organization in Canada will start uh, teaching, uh, for now it's uh, Ukrainian uh, 
uh, students for Ukrainian stu uh, schools. Yeah, we, we are going to start lessons about the Crimea and Crimean Tatars uh, history. So it's going to start. So the first lesson will be tomorrow so for the schools and students. Um, okay, well, unfortunately, we have now gone uh, past our time. It's now 11.01. Uh, uh, we do have more questions in the chat, uh, which I will share with our panelists uh, and uh, provide uh, answers to. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, again, our uh, panelists uh, for, for their uh, very interesting and timely remarks. Uh, Rustam Lashu, thank you as well for joining us, Marta. Um, Thank you also to uh, everyone who uh, took the time to join us online uh, and, and listen. Uh, of course, the UCC is uh, always ready to uh, work with you. So please let us know if you have any ideas, anything we can do to uh, cooperate and keep the issue of uh, Russian occupied Crimea, the plight of the Ukrainian citizens who are uh, living under this occupation. Uh, front and center, both in Canada and abroad. Uh, we are always ready to uh, accept help and work with you. So again, on behalf of the UCC, the Media Initiative for Human Rights and Postcards for Prisoners, thank you for, uh, for attending and thank you for your interest. And uh, we will be in touch soon, hopefully. So thank you very much.